Welcome back to the Student Hub Live. Well, in this session, we take a look at something that you may not know the Open University is involved with, and that is partnerships with the BBC. And we're going to take a look at one of these programmes that we've produced um, inside the Foreign Office. And I'm joined by um, Eddie and Will. Um, now, Edward Wastonage is um, uh, the chair of uh, DD103, investigating the social world, and he also runs the International Studies degree. And Will is a senior lecturer um, in politics and government, and you chair DD313, International Relations, which is core um, part of the university's International Studies programme. So many people don't know we do these things. Some people may not have even seen Inside the Foreign Office, which was played recently on BBC. Um, but I wonder if we can sort of start first talking about our role as the OU within these productions and then talk a little bit about the programme itself. So, well, why was it important to produce a series like this, both for us, I guess, and the BBC? Well, I think it's an extraordinarily uh, interesting time to look at Britain's foreign policy and how that's conducted. You know, as the, at this moment when we're leaving the European Union, one of the key pillars of our uh, foreign policy and strategy for many years is, is thrown up in the air. Uh, there's a whole process of kind of trying to reassemble and reconstruct our relationship with other countries around the globe, both our European partners, what the shape of that relationship is going to be like, uh, and developing new contacts and new uh, relationships in other parts of the world. Um, so I think the, that particular context, but the, this was, wasn't just a kind of Brexit-focused series. And in some ways, foreign policy is a very important, but also not very well known or understood area of government. You know, in, in some ways, it's, a, uh, it's one of the longest standing parts of government and yet is rarely seen. And this series provided a means by which to look behind the scenes at what some of the diplomatic service, as well as the politicians, the Secretary of State, um, uh, do on Britain's behalf in trying to navigate the country's position in the world. So I think both in terms of the specific context, but also more generally, it was a really fascinating thing to look at. So Britain's place in the world with a sort of fly on the wall documentary sort of approach to things that don't have a lot of access. I mean, is it a good thing that people don't know much about it? Why is it important to tell people about what happens inside the Foreign Office? Well, I think, I mean, certainly from the Foreign Office's perspective, I think they want to perhaps debunk some of the myths that surround uh, the, the art of diplomacy and some of the inner workings of, of, of what goes on because we all have these kind of fanciful notions of, of you know, Ferrero Rocher parties and ambassadors receptions and that kind of things. And actually, there's a lot of real nitty, -gr nitty gritty, a lot of graft that goes on helping Brits in trouble abroad or, you know, kind of more consular type things, which, which we don't necessarily think of as forming part of the Foreign Office's work. Um, um, and so I, I think so for, for them, it is, you know, really interesting to, to sort of showcase the, the, the wider work they do as, as well and, and some of the kind of complexities and relationships that they, um, they have to deal with. Do you think there's a sort of purpose, again, of sort of saying to people, you know, you might not ever be a Brit abroad or something like that, but actually there's, there's some security, I guess, in knowing that there are people whose job it is to make sure that the world is a safe place, that international law and order and those relationships between other countries are being negotiated by people who are not at these Ferrero Rocher parties? Yes, definitely. And I think that's what the series does quite well. It shows, you know, a lot of the kind of human stories and, and the interpersonal relationships that are really important in terms of consular staff, you know, dealing with families, um, yeah, and making sure that, you know, Britain's interests are sort of secured abroad. So uh, I think it, it's, it does an important job in that regard as well, definitely. And there's a few glitzy receptions in as well. Oh, of course. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we'd expect nothing less. Okay, so, I mean, this is obviously a great thing and it's good for the public, it's good for the foreign office is good for the BBC but why is it good for the OU and how does it tap into some of the curriculum? Do you want to? Well uh, I, I think for us it was, it was uh, really an, an interesting opportunity for Will and I to be involved in because you know we're both scholars of international relations and we're, we're involved in the Open University's own um, international studies curriculum quite heavily so uh, it was a good opportunity to try and uh, to a certain extent shape some of the program um, and, and to sort of build a relationship with them to, to show that you know that there, there's lots of interesting angles that can be looked at within our own curriculum areas as well um, that are touched on within the program so uh, you know we felt it was a good opportunity to get involved with them really yeah because there's a lot of politics in international relations as well and I guess this is quite a good example of showing how some of those negotiations need to be very sensitively handled 
Yeah, and it picks up on all sorts of things that are dealt with in the OU's curriculum uh, in politics and international relations. So there's, um, uh, in particular, the international relations side of things, so, um, part of our international studies degree, but issues that are dealt with um, in some of our level two politics mm -hmm. courses as well. Uh, there, are, there, there are quite clear kind of connections with the, with the issues that the BBC series was able to bring to the fore and some of the things that we look at more analytically within the OU's curriculum. So I think it was important. This kind of series is good for the OU in that respect as well because it, it draws people's attention uh, to some of the things that, that our curriculum helps to look at in more depth. Yeah, I mean, because there's a different thing between reading a theory of something and then seeing how it works in practice. And one of the things that I think, you know, w was really important is showing how these balances between the various sorts of, um, you know, motivations that various countries have in a very live situation can really affect things. You can have something that looks all well and good in a book, but mm. again, it's that application that uh, makes it so exciting. Yeah. Uh, and you and you see that in in the series. You see it in um, uh, Britain's attempt to get resolutions through the Security Council in the United Nations and having to work with allies. Those areas of cooperation um, that diplomats seek to build up. Um, the way countries try to create rules for governance in the international system, which is often seen as a, a realm that's beyond uh, governance, but nevertheless, countries try to create rules of governance there. Um, and I think also in terms of a particular, any particular country, Britain says it's pursuing its own interest in the international system, but it's also trying to promote British values, human rights, democracy, things like that, free trade. Uh, and you get a bit of a sense of, of that balancing as well. Um, from, from the programmes. Yeah, no, exactly. So the balancing of the national interests compared to what's right for the international community yeah. more broadly. And, yeah. and I guess that must be really challenging. It, it yeah. is, and, and particularly um, when dealing with countries that are, you know, at odds with some of those professed values, um, uh, the, where, but where, you know, significant commercial interests are at stake, one of the things that comes through very strongly in the programme is the importance of commercial interest and I think that is a very particular particular it's always there in foreign policy but it's had ad added emphasis in the in the post brexit period yeah. uh, and so there's that kind of negotiating going on as well and you also obviously have British companies wanting access to to countries where um, uh, compromises may need me need to be made over over issues of values as well mm. And so getting that balance right must be really critical, especially for a university involved in something that could arguably work very well for the Foreign Office. So that leads me to my next area about what you did and, and, and what your role was and, and how that panned out. Yeah, I mean, we uh, started off uh, having uh, a few uh, meetings with the BBC and, and the program makers. Um, I thought you were going to say soirees. Not soirees, <laughs> certainly not. And that's one thing actually, I mean, we would have loved to have been involved in some of the actual film, wouldn't we, Will? Because all these exotic locations, many of which actually didn't make it into the final cut because they had to get, you know, um, a really, real broad spread and they had to pick the examples that made the best television, yeah. ultimately. And I guess being uh, yeah. a part on the wall documentary, again, you, you, you didn't have access to that filming, did you? No, no. I mean, we, we got access to kind of rough cuts, didn't we? Yeah. So we'd, we'd look over yeah. stuff in, in the edit and we'd provide provide um, you know kind of advice on the commentary and things like that but again it's really the sort of the the drama that's taking place or, you know on screen that and that that is the point of the program it's not you know that there's a kind of analytical commentary over it that you might get say on a BBC4 documentary you know which is much more you know kind of talking heads discussing things and putting things apart it's really just let the personalities do this the, do the talking and when you've got people like Boris Johnson in there you know he kind of um, Tells his own yeah. story, doesn't it? Much <laughs> of the filming was just uh, the producer plus a cameraman, that was it. So yeah. they didn't want academics standing around uh, getting in the way of that. <laughs> either, so, uh, uh, but it was interesting talking about because we talked to the, with the producers at a reasonably early stage of their plans and then at various points as they reported back on how the filming had gone. Some ideas for filming had to be dropped because access wasn't being provided. Right. Other areas were filmed but then didn't make the programme. So there was a, it was a kind of evolving project that we discussed with the producers. But, you know, it's a BBC film in the end, so it's their, it's their final choice as to kind of what goes in. So your role was, was a lot of the meetings and, I guess, ensuring the balance was right. But there was also a lot of stuff in terms of making sure that things were factually correct. Yeah, and particularly later on in the process once there was a 
the, a rough cut of the programs and a, and a voiceover narration for, for parts of it, checking through that to make sure that there weren't any errors, um, things weren't phrased in a, a way that we wouldn't be happy with and things like that. Um, sometimes just finding a form of words that worked in a particular, uh, a particular frame, given that you can't go on at length in a narration on a, on a programme. You know, it's very short, 20-second clips of, of narration, so it's... And I guess tone is very important as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it is. Um, and I th on the whole, th there weren't any major problems on that, but um, it's kind of having that second check is the role that we provide within the production. OK. Um, I want to talk about some of the programmes as well, and we can maybe sort of talk a little bit around what you did in those, because there, there were three, and I think they all showcase a, a really nice range of what actually happened in that. Um, the first programme um, was at the UN, um, about Britain trying to work with other countries to get agreements on, on the Security Council. So, so what happened in that programme, and what did that highlight that's, that's interesting, I guess, to students about international relations? Uh, I think some of the things that I touched on before, um, the... the the kind of catch of the programme was maintaining power and influence in, uh, at the international level. So it had a, a slight kind of Brexit angle to that in that can Britain continue to perform at, at the top level uh, post-Brexit. And there's some acknowledgement in the programme that whereas previously we would operate in forums like the UN in very close cooperation with European allies, that's not as much the case uh, or not going to be as much the case. Um, but you also get an insight of, in where Britain, uh, in terms of foreign policy, wants to promote a particular resolution at the UN, how it has to try and negotiate and navigate with, with allies to get s supporters on board. Um, but there's all, it also has an interesting side to it in that it deals with some of the relationship with Russia, which over this period has been uh, very fraught at times. And you get a sense that this is, there's some acknowledgement from diplomats that Britain is now uh, and has been for a long time, arguably, really a middle-ranking power in the world. It's not um, a, a the status of, of countries like the US and Russia and China um, in many respects. Um, and so it has to try and get others on board to, um, to, to uh, promote its aims, and particularly in contexts like the aftermath of the Skripal poisoning, trying to get other European allies in the United States to back up Britain's diplomatic protests at, at what the Russians had done. Uh, so it's interesting to see, see that unfolding at the UN level. So it's both showing up the limitations of power, but also showing how Britain utilises relationships Indeed. to gain more power. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah um, so something quite interesting that, that follows on from that in the second one as well, in terms of uh, the kind of Brexit negotiations that are happening and, and, and the relationships between Britain and its European partners as well. Um, and you see in that one, which I found really interesting, is the kind of tension between the elected politicians, because obviously with, with the um, um, British foreign policy, you have the, the foreign minister and secretary of state for foreign affairs, who um, will be the kind of public face, as it were, uh, you know, who is a part of the elected government of the day. But then you have the civil servants, all of the foreign office staff who are permanent members of staff who have to work with whichever government is in is in power. Um, their job is to serve the government of the day under the confines of the law or something like that. I can't remember the exact wording. But anyway, so and what you see there is this tension between these people who are, you know, experts in certain areas and they're kind of dealing with Boris Johnson who's going a bit rogue here and there, you know, yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. saying, I want to give this speech in French and they're going, please can you just <laughs> you know hold it down a little bit and there's lots of kind of eye rolling type moments there which is quite interesting yeah. to to observe did so did he notice <laughs> perhaps on watching it back afterwards maybe he did and you can see why a fly on the wall documentary would appeal to that Absolutely. sort of approach as well yeah. but what did it what did it then show you i guess about um about all of these issues like power and control and and you know getting one's way with so many, you know, different um, motivations. Somebody's got to do their job. Somebody wants something else done. Uh, it's it's all very um, subversive, isn't it? If, maybe that's not the right word, but yeah, lots of undercurrents of things going on. Yeah, loads, loads, and that's I think the, the beauty of a series like this is that you get to see 
all of those things play out there, you know, yeah. to, to, that's one of the best things about it, I think, was the access that they got. And, and going back to the first mm -hmm. episode, you know, the access at the UN, seeing the behind the scenes things, yeah. the negotiations, you know, kind of uh, with, with, with Russia, with, with other countries, you know, that's kind of fascinating to see, really. Yeah. Mm. And I, I think that's one of the interesting things about the idea of diplomacy is it has these different reputations. Some of, on one hand, it can be, you know, the idea of being diplomatic is being smooth and ironing over differences. And um, on the other hand, the, the act of diplomacy is often seen as secretive and underhand and that kind of yeah. thing. So you, there are different aspects to it. I don't think you've got a great insight into the really underhand stuff that might go on because yeah, yeah. that's not the sort of thing you get access to for anything. But, no. um, but you see some of the negotiation over which points to emphasise. Foreign Secretary perhaps yeah. stress this rather than that, that kind of uh, intervention being made by the civil servants. Uh, perhaps not do the whole thing in French. Yeah, 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 yeah. So again, how it's managed. Yeah. So I mean, the, the first two programmes are, are very sort of um, expected, I guess, in terms of what you would see. But the third one is really interesting because this looked at three consular cases. And you both said that, that for you, this was the most interesting and, and moving part of, of, of the whole series in terms of the human story behind some of these things. So tell us what happened in, in the third episode in these yeah. cases. Personally, I'm more interested in the other things, but I think it was more dramatic, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think it, it, it made better TV than yeah, the third one, yeah. but our, our interests are probably in more in line with the first two, yeah. 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 All right, well, but I like it, the third yeah. one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But the, the cases were interesting, and, mm. and, and, and going back to kind of what I was saying at the start, they show that kind of, um, that, that human drama element mm -hmm. and the kind of more, the, the consular side of things, which is, you know, um, dealing with British in, uh, citizens who are abroad who might have got in trouble. So there was uh, a, a case of um, some Brits who were put in jail in Cambodia wasn't there. There was um, a, a mem following a member of the forced marriages unit yeah. um, dealing with uh, a British Iraqi dual national who was um, in a forced marriage situation in Iraq and trying to get her out of there. And then a um, following part of the emergent, it was a rapid response team, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, yeah. going to um, British Virgin Islands after Hurricane Irma. So you know, following those those cases was, was very different from what you'd expect from the, the kind of normal diplomacy did, yeah. stuff. Yeah, and you got a sense of you know, fairly ordinary people from all sorts of walks yeah. of life mm. working quite hard behind the scenes and particularly those kind of cases of Brits in trouble abroad which might hit the headlines and get reported at a fairly, uh, at a kind of high level in the mm. British media. But there's very little reporting of what the Foreign Office is doing behind the scenes naturally mm. because mm. often it's it's kind of delicate negotiations and yeah. uh, demarches to the, to the opposite numbers and that kind of thing. Mm. Because you've spoken about the tension about, about British, uh, I guess, needs and motivations and international ones as well. But this was a lot more practical in mm. terms of actually yeah. getting visas, access, flights, yeah. and, and those practical things yeah. that you often don't think about. Yeah. This wasn't really about morality and, and, and you know, what's necessarily right and wrong. Yeah, mm. and in the, in the Hurricane Irma case, it was the response team trying to track down a British couple who needed to be rehoused, needed medical supplies. So quite practical uh, kind of emergency relief, if you like, in that mm. case. In the forced marriage case, it was uh, very precise negotiations over mm. when will we pick her up, when will she come into the embassy, what, what plane will we get her on, that kind of, you know, very, very detailed planning of how to, how to get this person out and back to the UK. Mm. Yeah, safely as well, because and obviously safely, yeah. the security situation in Iraq at the time was, was, really, was really unstable mm. as well. So you see the kind of the consular official go out in a bulletproof jacket mm. and stuff, you know, it's all, it's all quite exciting, mm. but it's, you know, serious stuff that they're dealing with, yeah. Mm. No, absolutely. And, and how do you think then it turned out? I think it's as, as far as a uh, fly on the wall type documentary goes. I thought it was, you know, great, especially in terms of the access uh, and 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 the human drama behind, you know, um, some of the cases that are dealing with. I thought it did that really well. Yeah, the same. I think, you know, it was never meant to be an analytical series with experts talking, sitting down and discussing the challenges of UK foreign policy. But as a fly on the wall, showed you something you don't often see. I think it was great, and to some extent, it it prompts and promote promotes that interest in the area as a whole yeah. and then we can provide material on open learn that goes a bit deeper and modules and uh, qualifications that explore these things more kind of academically if you Absolutely. like as well. So if we could end just by telling people about the open learn concept because this is something that I guess you know from an academic point of view you've added so much depth to the program and often we do this on open learn where we'll yeah. take something that we've done and show behind the scenes um, other articles and there's a whole wealth of material we've got the link to that um, on the Student Hub Live website and I'm sure HJ will put that in the chat as well. What did you do on open learn and how did that add to the program? We did a, a 
uh, three main things. One was um, a briefing about the Foreign Office, what it is, where it's located, how its history. Uh, secondly, a jargon buster. So there's a lot of diplomatic terminology that's used in the programs and uh, in the area more generally. And so we, we gave some background on the, some of the key terms. Uh, and then an audio discussion um, involving two UK experts on UK foreign policy discussing some of the challenges of UK foreign policy. Excellent. So if you'd like to take a look at that, then please do. And Kelvin says, kudos to you both. You're do both doing some legendary work, which, <laughs> which you indeed are. Um, so, so thank you, Addy and Will, for coming and, and filling us in on that. And if you'd like to find out more, as I say, go and take a look at the Open Learn website. Uh, and you can also find the link to that page uh, on the Student Hub Live website. Right, we're now going to show you um, a little bit of some of the other things that the Open University do um, uh, in co-production with the BBC. And then I'll be back to find out about the library and how they can support you and your students. Studies. I'll see you soon.